Hello, my name is Steve Kotze. I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. I'm interviewing Mr. Charles Brooks Taylor on Friday, October 20th at the Sharonville Branch Library. Our camera operator today is Nancy Wade. Mr. Taylor, tell us a little bit about your life before you entered the service. Well, I was born and raised in a small town called Morristown, Ohio. My great-grandfather founded the town. I grew up there. I went to high school on a bus 10 miles away to St. Clairsville, Ohio, which was the county seat. Graduated from high school there. I lived a normal life. I did have a stepfather. My father had expired in a car accident. And I left the area very shortly after graduating from high school and went to Canton, Ohio, and worked for different companies, ending up with Tempkin Roller Bearing. I was the head inspector in the Camp Renis plant there, had a very good job. Then I enlisted, enlisted in the Air Force. I had flown in high school at a municipal airport, so I was interested in that. I would have probably got drafted anyhow, although I did have deferments offered to me by the company. I went ahead and enlisted in the Air Force and started through a lot of schools, about a year of different schools, which amounted about 94 hours. And I ended up in combat in a B-24. Very good. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the enlistment process? How did that work and where were you sworn in and then what happened immediately after that? Well, I enlisted in a, uh, somewhere in Canton, uh, I think I got the papers out of the post office. And uh, I ended up going to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, the old fort there was doing the inductions. And uh, I was there maybe three or four days. And they said they wanted to send me to some schools because I already I thought about entering college, and I ended up uh, leaving Columbus after three or four days as an inducted. Uh, I listened, and uh, you know when you're listening, you have a one flavor name. If you're drafted, you have a three. So I asked for what I got. I didn't know I was going to end up in combat in a B-24. I started out going to various schools. Started out in the Yale V-12 program, which was amazing to me that. They even had it set up. But I got a lot of schooling. It was fast, and maybe 18 hours a day you went to school. Uh, you'd have much time to sleep. And I strived to be number one all the time, not knowing that that's what they were looking for to put on these air crews. And I have equivalent to a mechanical engineer's degree. So they put me in aerial engineering. I was the uh, engineer on the plane. I knew the airplane very well. That's how I got in. I just simply enlisted and went through schools and I kept getting better and better and better and more. I think I was at about eight or ten bases. Finally, it come time to go overseas, and I went. Now, where, did you have basic training in addition to the school? Oh, yes. Yes, I had uh, schooling in engi engines, hydraulics, aer aerodynamics, uh, electrical. Uh, you get a we a crash course. Like I say, I went to, uh, I can't think of the base in Louisiana. And they really run us. I run to lunch. I run to the post office. I run to school. And the schedule was a very tough schedule because we were behind, the U.S. was, getting ready. And uh, we had lost out in the Pacific. Uh, through the Philippines and withdrew out of there. The Japanese had the whole area cleaned down into Indonesia, Barneo. They were even bombing Australia. When we were in Fenton, which is 100 miles south of Darwin, we were bombed uh, while I was there three times by the Japanese trying to get into Australia. We actually got credit from the Australian people for saving Australia. Our Air Force it was called the Flying Circus because we uh, fought the Japanese uh, from coming in to bomb us. We did have some fighter planes there also. Well now, after, after basic training, how did you get the 
divided up so that you ended up in the Pacific. Tell us about that. Well, we were, I know, picked at random somehow. Uh, at one of these different bases, we were in New Mexico. Uh, I got assigned to a crew, and none of us knew each other. Here's ten men coming together in a B-24. We don't know each other. Uh, you have to get along socially, emotionally. Uh, you know your job on the plane. There's two armor gunners. Uh, there's uh, the head engineer. I had an assistant engineer, and a co-pilot, a navigator, a pilot, and a uh, bombardier. Ten of us. I flew in the top turn and also the tail turn if I had to. We had a ball turn. They later took those out. Very dangerous. They, when you, sometimes they wouldn't retract. When you land, they were about as low as the last as the tail wheel. You could scrape the runway going down. And you're in there and you're tied up in your had to be very small to get in there. Uh, but we were assigned these crews. We got together in uh, in New Mexico and we started flying uh, experimental flying, bombing runs over Almagardo. And you finally you get to know each other. You hope you know each other. What happens on a crew in a B-24 or any other large bomber? You get someone on there that does not fit in with the other people. He can ruin all of your lives. He can kill you. We had that happen overseas with one of our men. And, uh, I refused to fly with him. And I went up. The worst thing you can do in flying is sandbagging. That's to go with anybody. You don't have a set crew. You don't have your uh, friends that you schooled with, trained with. Uh, you just are, you're an outsider, and you don't last long if you're sandbagging. Uh, but that's a story I'll put in later. Maybe what happened on a on a flight over uh, a night flight, very dangerous flight. Uh, we were over the Stanley Mountains. We had fighter cover. I think we lost 20 fighter planes that couldn't get up over the mountains in a bad storm. We were here May Day and everywhere. We never got home. We landed in a fighter place in Leahy in New Guinea, and we were a B-24 sitting there in the morning when the daylight came with a bunch of fighter planes. It looked like a, a mother hen with a bunch of chickens. And the fact it wasn't going to let us land, you have a... Uh, IF on your plane, identification, friend or foe, I know what, and, and they were shooting at us as we were landing. They didn't turn the lights on. So we got in, we only had about 50 gallon of gas in each tank. We had to set them down, which we did. But uh, getting on a crew, that's a very touchy thing. Uh, it seemed to be just done uh, hap haphazardly by whoever was in charge. What in Bush that? Could you tell us a little bit about how you ended up going to Australia rather than Europe? Well, as I say, we went through the training programs, Alma Garda bombing and all that, and our crew got to know each other. We didn't get much time off. They had, a couple of them had their wives there. They were allowed to leave on Sunday, but we were very busy, busy. Finally, we get our operations 100%. Uh, and they're going to send us, we're assigned to the 8th Air Force. See, so we're all shipped up with our equipment to uh, Houghton, Maine, Houghton Air Base. Uh, it was in the wintertime, very cold, 55 below zero. We're in steam barracks. A lot of people there waiting to get transportation overseas, sometimes in their own planes, uh, mostly by ship. And they had a lot of guards going, flotillas going at the same time. So we had all of our equipment for the 8th Air Force assigned to us. We were filled out, I think in Salt Lake City we got most of our equipment. We were being moved all over the United States, McDill Airfield, North Florida, and so forth. So we're sitting in Houghton waiting on transportation. Someone in Washington, D.C. or somewhere changed the plan alphabetically from A to R and R to Z. And my name was Taylor then, so I was in the second half. And the first half, they took them and sent them on to the 8th Air Force, or got ready to send them by ship. They turned us around, the R to Z, and took us to Michigan to an air base, 
and said we're going to go to Australia. We picked up new B-24s which were built right in outside of Detroit and we flew from there to California for a few days then to Hawaii and we kind of skipped islands down New F uh, Fiji Islands. We had a great time in Fiji to the days we were there. Uh, we saw our first native. Johnson Island we went to. It only had one palm tree on it. But we got into Australia to Townsville and uh, then we were assigned to Fenton which was 100 miles south of Darwin. When we got there we had all the winter clothes for New, uh, for England and we later got assigned khakis and so forth. It took a good while to do that. I went on my first mission uh, the third day I was in Australia. I remember the jelly and peanut butter sandwiches. In fact, we flew two missions the same day. That was over Guadalcanal, my first mission. And we were 12, maybe 12 feet over the, over the beach. Uh, a lot of people were hurt there. Marines, Army, so forth. But we, we covered the uh, Guadalcanal there. So that's how I got to Australia. It was a, a change in operations. Otherwise, I'd have been in the 8th Air Force. Ended up in the 5th Air Force, which covered 3 million square miles of water and islands at that time. Now, the general that commanded the 5th Air Force? His name was Kenny. A very well-liked person. Uh, I'm going to say something that's a little uh, 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 against what most people believe in the United States. George Kennedy was a, a wonderful man. He had a lot of training in the Air Force. He was in charge of the 5th. Of course, we had other subdivisions. Uh, most of the people that flew combat did not admire uh, MacArthur as much as people believe. I think he was a fine statistician and a soldier. Uh, I think he was 15th in West Point. His father was a commandant at West Point. And he thought he was going to be the next president of the United States. Uh, I didn't vote for Truman, but I would have. I, I wasn't able to vote for Truman. Uh, he cut him down some, but he lost a lot of people. He was a great statistician, but uh, I watched all these invasions. I covered 11 invasions, and I know it, uh, a couple of them. There's a lot of people went in on the wrong side of the islands, and uh, he's back on a ship 100 miles back, and a lot of people killed unnecessarily. So I thought that was uh, true at Guadalcanal. I watched them dump soldiers out. Uh, 100 feet from shore and their equipment, they weighed 400 pounds. Half of them drowned it before they ever got ashore. The Japanese are sitting there waiting for a machine gun nest uh, six weeks ahead of time. And MacArthur planned that invasion. So while he did a lot of uh, strategic things, I think he's a great soldier, but uh, we didn't like him. Well, one of the things that General Kenny was famous for was his was his low and slow approach, his skip bombing and going in rather low. Well, he wanted to go one step at a time, and uh, uh, we, there was a lot of Japanese to be covered. These islands that the Japanese took over, a lot of people didn't realize that the Japanese, well, the Germans actually sent the Japanese some oil that they could spare, and, and the Irish helped transport it. <laughs> I got some Irish money. Uh, Balakapapan in Barneo was one of the main refineries. Sarabah in Indonesia was the other big refinery. And our job was to knock these two refineries out as often as we could. Uh, tough missions, both of them, because they're well guarded with fighter planes and ACAC and a long ways to get there long ways to come back home, no fighter cover, and a lot of water to cover. Now we had uh, Dutch Indonesian money. We could buy boats or anything if we got shot down. But the uh, thing is, the Japanese paid these guys more than, the, than we give them Dutch money. So we didn't have much rescue. If you got shot down, that was it. Uh, you didn't come home. 
but our, we knocked out these refineries. Uh, when we leave, 20,000 feet of smoke and fire, you can see them climbing back up and getting them back in repair. Probably this represented half of the Japanese oil. Uh, in Europe, it was Pileski. You know, in Iraq, we're losing uh, a lot of great Americans. I think we've lost 2,500 people. But over Pulaski and the 8th and 9th Air Force, they lost 2,800 a day bombing them. But so, the, the raids you went on in the Pacific were longer than the ones yeah. in Europe. I was on one mission 18 hours and 40 minutes. And that was the longest mission flown till the B-29 come over. And you have to take, take a lot of gas, it cuts down on your bomb run, your amount of ammunition you're carrying. And uh, we used to load, the B-24 bear weight was 32,000 pounds. We used to take off weighing 100,000 pounds. And it takes a long runway to get it off the ground, maybe two miles long. Actually, you disappear, it's on even ground, and you're trying to get enough speed up to get off. Uh, 150 mile an hour to get down the runway, and here's the ocean coming up ahead of it. You gotta go, <laughs> but uh, you burn your gas up fast. It takes uh, I don't know how many gallon of gas to get up there and get into formation. Uh, our protection was to protect each other. Without fighter cover, we flew a very tight formation, formation. and we've got. Uh, about 18 B, uh, uh, 50 caliber guns from all directions on the plane. Even the bombardier, he has his own gun. The only people not firing was the navigator, radio, pilot, co-pilot. And we carried a lot of handheld ammunition inside the airplane. We used to kick it out of their feet. It was a scatter type of thing. And one time we went to Kandari and the Emperor's birthday. It was 5,000 Japanese standing at parade rest on the runway. We loaded with these incendiaries, and when they hit the ground, they explode, they're full of bolts and nuts, and they go waist high, particularly to kill people. And they just skip along. Uh, we never looked at the oil we threw out. We don't want to see any result of that. But I, that to me, a little inhumane to do that, but that's part of war. Now, you, of war. you were on the 51 plane, the number of your plane? What do you mean? I was reading the history, and it said something about your your plane number was number 51. Could have been. I can't recall that. The numbers, who, uh, we were in the 530th. We were called a flying circus. We all used... Uh, Symbols. Ours was uh, uh, a duck on the plane. Its tails were painted with these. We were quite well known as the uh, flying serpents. We got four presidential citations as a unit uh, because of our operations. Uh, I, don't, I think that was more than anybody got. We got a lot of medals. I think I had. 12 air battles alone. Uh, I guess that was in lieu of money. <laughs> <laughs> now, of, of all the different things that you did as the engineer on the, on the plane, what, what did you like the most and what did you like the least? Well, I was responsible for every nut and bolt on that airplane. And I had studied awfully hard the blueprints and so forth, which would almost fill this room. Uh, more than fill this room. Uh, you have standard procedures. If you lose an engine, you want to cut it off quick or it'll tear itself right out of the cell. You learned how to handle the electrical, the fuels, and so forth. I enjoyed the engineering part. I was respected by the crew for that. Um, I'll tell you a real quick story. It was a corpus. Uh, I was in Texas at a base. We we're going to fly a night mission. I would go down and look the airplane over before, and the pilot of that plane has a right to fly it or reject it. If he takes the responsibility of something wrong with it, he has to sign for that. He's responsible for that. 
But I'm the guy who goes down in preliminary with, we have a ground crew, usually a sergeant, master sergeant, and his two assistants who are keeping this airplane in shape. I go down and talk with him and see what's going on. Is the plane ready to go? Is it gassed up? I looked at this airplane and the white tread was showing through the tars, on all the tars. Uh, these are doubles in front, doubles in the back. You've got eight tires to look at. And they were wore out on the airplane. And I talked to the crew uh, master. I said, uh, how come the tires haven't been changed? Well, they're going to fly one more, one or two more missions, and then they'll go into routine. And they'll do the engine and the tires at the same time. So I put it on a red line. And my crew come down. It's on a Friday. And we're going to get a weekend off, which we hadn't had a weekend off for a long time. And the fact that we're not going to fly, we're not going to get the weekend off. And this, a couple of these guys had their wives there. So it was a little heart up to them. So they all come down in a truck. And I said, well, boys, we're not going to go today. I redlined the airplane. And the pilot went in, looked at the book, and he agreed with me. I said, uh, well, he said we want to fly anyhow. I said, well, you can go, but I won't fly on this airplane. It's not safe. So the pilot agreed with me, and he kept the red line on there. A Chinese pilot came down with his crew later in a truck, and he looked at this airplane and the book, and he signed a release on the red line. He put it on a, an X, a red X, which meant he was responsible for it. On takeoff, the tires blew out, and they landed in a bomb drop. And a hole where they kept all the bombs. This whole crew was killed, ten of them. So from then on, when I said I ain't flying, the rest of the crew said I ain't either. So that helped me in my job. Now, why you? But I enjoyed. I enjoyed uh, knowing what I knew about the airplane. And I, a couple of times we lose an engine, and I'd have it stop right away. The pilot depended on me to do that. That's my job. You Plus, I was a gunner, I, and I was also the first aid man on the ship. You talked about one time when you had to crash land. Tell us a little bit about that incident. We drew a black bean. The jar of beans, all white except one black bean. And if there's 22 crews, there's 23 beans in the jar, in the dark. Now we happened to draw the black bean ones, which was a reconnaissance mission over a lot of Japanese air bases, or near the bases. And also, at the same time, we're looking for shipping. One of our primary uh, causes was always to look for Japanese shipping. And uh, we found a, an oil freighter in a little island, covered with trees, trying to disguise it. But it was so easy to see uh, they were unloading oil, the line going up the ship, and it was one of the bases we'd already covered. So we, uh, the bombardier loved that to practice these bombing, and he missed about ten. Finally, we blew the ship in half. There was a guy in a rowboat going back and forth <laughs> every time we drop a bomb. We got Akak far from somewhere on a hillside. And the first pass we made at it, we knocked it out, whatever it was. We're shooting at us. And it's a beautiful little town. We, with an atrium, you can see dogs and cats running on the ground, all the kids, all the. So we took a vote would we bother this village? And we said, no, we're going to leave it alone. There was a church there and so forth. So we did our job on the ship. But as we continued on up, we were heading for a final point in Davio, which is southern the Philippines. And uh, the Japanese had had the Philippines completely for three or four years. So we get up there, and uh, it's bad weather, and we're, we can hide in the clouds a lot. And but coming out of Davio, they started sending Zeeks and Zeros on us. Now, they can't stay in the air too long, uh, maybe a, an hour. So they relay you. All the way home, we figured we might have had 50 Japanese planes on them. They're trying to knock us down. They're doing a pretty good job. We got two engines knocked out. And we fought all the way down to Timor. Now, maybe you've heard about the Timor insurrection ahead of us. 
When we had any bombs left coming home, we never wanted to bring them and land with them. We'd drop them on Timor. There was nothing in Timor worth anything. We'd even knock out toilets <laughs> with the bombs just to get rid of the bomb and not land with live uh, bombs. Uh, I've never, I have another story about a live bomb, if you want to hear it, uh, that happened. Uh, arm electrically from his place up in the nose of the plane. And uh, as he kicks them off, the unhook and drop. It can drop one at a time, or two at a time, or all at one time, whatever. And when the bombardier is on a bomb run, he's controlling the airplane. He's flying the airplane. He's actually controlling the direction, the height, the whole bit. It's his for that time because the bomb site is all set up with it, and so forth. And he called back, he said, Charlie, one well, of the bombs didn't drop. He said, it's armed and it's turning. What can you do about it? Well, we have an egg, uh, we had a magnesium hex in the bomb bay for one purpose, chop these bomb uh, holders out. You actually chop right, you chop right through that plate. So I get back there, and the Bombay doors are open, and, and, and a lot of air coming in there. You know, I, now I couldn't even get down the runway, I'm so big, but uh, then I had to take my shoes off, everything off, to get down the runway, and it's open. And I, I chopped that uh, bomb rack out, and the bomb dropped to maybe 200 feet and went off. Blew us back up another 200 feet. Uh, all I ever heard is, good job, Charlie, good job. But that was a close one. That was probably as close as any. I've been ready to bail out. I never bailed out. I was ready about three or four times to bail out. Never had to bail out. But that was about as close. <laughs> but she went off. She would have went off inside. Too. Tried, yeah. yeah. Timor, we, uh, we dropped everything out of the airplane. We're, we're running on two engines. The airplane will fly on two engines. The only trouble. It was two engines on one side out. That makes the airplane very hard to uh, keep in the air and uh, to guide it right. Uh, the pilot and the co-pilot were really earning their money on that. And we had enough gas. We were on. We even chopped our, threw our guns out, threw our, all the ammunition out. That's the day we carry uh, five thousand, maybe ten thousand rounds of ammunition. There. One of the dangerous things flying in echelon. Uh, together is if you're firing these bullets, these shells come back, they're red hot, can't touch them. They come through a square sheet and out the back end. You can knock the plane behind you down <laughs> with your empty cartridges. So you have to get the slipstream so that they're dissipating. A lot of detail like that. We're over Timor and we're deciding whether to bail out. We all have one man life for us and all and a couple of big rafts in the plane, but we decided to hang in there for Australia. It's a beautiful sight when we've seen it. And the other engine is uh, kicking out. Now, with one engine, you're, uh, one point we were losing 100 feet a minute, uh, our altitude. We're down to about 4,000 feet. Uh, we ain't got much time in the air if that engine goes out. So when it did go out, we were over the coast of Australia, and I don't know how far deep we were. And I got the wheels down, and uh, we decided maybe we'd put them back up and go in belly up, down. It might be safer that way. You know, the wheels would tear you up. So we put the wheels back up and slid in, and we were cutting trees down maybe six inches in diameter. Uh, the last thing I did, when I chipped my knee bone, I had to turn off four big valves, the main tanks of gasoline. And I'm the last guy who did that. So I didn't really get strapped in my seat when it hit the ground. I got through eh, from here to the, that door, uh, down through the airplane. Uh, but I was pretty agile in those days. Uh, when it finally stopped sliding, uh, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was going to slide forever. <laughs> You can't believe you hit the ground 150 mile an hour, how fast, you, how far you can go. This thing weighed 30,000 pounds, and uh, finally it stopped. 
Well, we are the radio worked, so we got radio contact with the base, and we got out of there, and they came and got picked the parts off of it, and uh, so forth. So it was a tragic thing. Uh, we got a new airplane. Uh, another crew crashed in, I heard later. Uh, we were gone then, but we survived. Uh, the ones that were alive on, on board. No, uh, you hurt your knee on that flight. It, you I also, chipped a bone. I still have a knot on there. You also won a Purple Heart a couple times. Yeah. So, yeah. How did that happen? Well, I got, I was in, my tail turn, yeah, I got hurt. I went back, I could fill in almost any position, the side gun, the tail turn, the ball turn, I went one or two missions. I, that's, that's it. You got to actually set inside yourself, and that's they finally took them out. Uh, they didn't have much good aid. Anyhow, I was back on a tail turn, and a Japanese guy come up on me. He had a mustache. I could see his mustache. And when he get that close, man, <laughs> what am I doing in the Air Force? Why, why you know, why didn't I join the wax or something? Uh, the bullet was ricocheting inside and it hit my knee and the next thing I knew we're under combat I had a shoe full of blood it cut the nerve in my leg it didn't hurt that bad it, when you get hit with a bullet full force it's like somebody took a ball peen hammer and wham hard as you could hit a guy uh, it was slowed down a little bit ricocheting and it hit me just below the joint and uh, I put a tourniquet on my leg myself. Uh, I was the first aid man. That's paid off. When we got back, uh, they took me to the hospital. And no, he set the guy sucked me under a eucalyptus tree, and he had a one of these hand sewing machines with his foot. And I smoked, and then I, I smoked a little. I smoked a whole pack of camels. I did. He said, "What kind of a stitch you want?" <laughs> and he, I said, "Put a baseball stitch in it, so I can show you." <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I got a baseball stitch. Uh, he said, "Now if it turns gangrene, we'll have to amputate your leg." I said, "There ain't no way." I, I had a night uh, military of 45 caliber. I strapped on my gun. <laughs> in a way. I'm still walking on it. Although uh, with this osteoarthritis that is set in from my operation, I had this knee operated on a, a year ago, and I think he left a pair of pliers in there. But uh, arthritis is set in that knee and this one both, and it'll probably go up to my hips. So I'm, that's why I'm taking those experimental shots to see if I can stop it. Now, you were in Australia when the war came to an end? Uh, no. I had been sent back, just sent back. I was sent back to California and uh, finally to Chinook Field in, uh, outside of Chicago. I was teaching air, airplane, all the mechanics, of, uh, aerodynamics and so forth. <coughs> when they dropped the atomic bomb, uh, I was... Uh, you had to have 85 points to get out. I had 185 points. There was no center open. They opened up below Indianapolis, and I was one of the first hundred was out of there. In fact, I may not even be out of the service. They, the GSA screwed up and didn't have the form. They hand typed my discharge. They owe me money. <laughs> but anyhow, I was one of the first hundred men to come out of Atterbury, which is a separation center set up below Indianapolis. But I was sent home and uh, I think in February and then the war really was over in August. So, so I goes, I got out August the 15th, uh, 1945. So a picture of a B-24 like the ones you flew in. Yes. This is a picture of uh, two B-24s flying over looks to be an island much like in the Pacific where you yeah. would have flown. And then in addition you also brought with you a picture of your crew right. and front of your plane here. 
and you're the second one from yeah. the left yeah. in the front row. Yeah. And then there's a smaller picture here of a of another. I'm the first one on the left row. The first one on the left row. That's as far as I can go. And then we have here a map of the area that the fifth operated in, in the Pacific. Three million square miles of islands and water. We also were the occupying force that went into Japan. The fifth Air Force went through all these islands right on into Japan and stayed there as an occupying force at the end of the war. So they did a lot of duty. They're now up at Plattsburgh, New York, at a base of 50. They took our 380th number and even a 530th. In fact, I gave the commanding officer a leather jacket, which I could have sold for a thousand dollars. I'm sure. And all the emblems it. on it, and he cried when I gave it to him. He, I've got the letter, and he's thanking me, but I gave it to him anyhow. The full colonel. These are some of the things that you were given in return for your service your awards and patches yes. and, and medals. Now, one of the things on here is a silver star. Do you remember how you came to get the silver star? I got my knee hurt, Scott. I helped land that airplane. That was it. Yeah, that's the third highest medal ever given by the U.S. government. Silver star is pretty distinguished. Yeah, it's the third highest medal. I. Uh, Distinguished Flying Cross is a well-earned medal. Uh, Purple Heart, of course. Uh, the Air Medals were given uh, not routinely, but more frequently. And I think there's 12 of those there. And I got the South Pacific, the Philippine. Uh, after the war, I was sent another Philippine medal. I was offered a chance to go to Manila and be presented a medal. Uh, I didn't really want to go but myself. They would have paid, uh, I think, half my way, uh, POW, Philippine Airlines, and put me up in Manila. But I didn't, I ended up not going. But we, uh, the Filipinos liked us very much, as the Australians. We were the really favorites of the Australians, because we, uh, we're given credit for helping stop the invasion of the Japanese. And we took leave every 20 missions. We would get a 10-day leave maybe to Adelaide, beautiful city. And we were treated great by the people. In the war and, and, uh, and how you got to work for them. Well, I, I graduated from college. Okay, I'm recording. Okay, so after the yeah. war, you came home and went to college. Tell Finished us college, yes. I, I graduated and uh, I went to work two or three different companies, Temkin Rollerberg. I was a head inspector in the plant, a very good job. Uh, then I went to a heating company. Uh, I worked for Wright Engines. Uh, we made a lot of uh, drilling equipment. Uh, if I'd have stayed there, probably the owner I was his assistant to the president. He probably would have given me the company, but I left went to Europe. I stayed six months. Uh, I was looking for a job. I was offered a couple of jobs. Then I declined to come back. And uh, then I went into piping. Uh, first I worked at the Atomic Energy Commission down in Portsmouth, Ohio. They spent a billion dollars down there, refraction of uh, uranium and so forth. I learned a lot there. I had 5,000 business cards when I left and I probably got another college education. From there I went into this company that sold piping products and I stayed there 30 years and retired at the age of 62. I'm uh, glad I did. Uh, so I'm going to get all my Social Security money back, maybe. I'm 86 in November. But uh, in the company, uh, I was the number one man in sales. I was the Midwest manager four states, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And I liked my work. I never had two days the same. Uh, we only sold wholesale. We had 34,000 different products we sold. Very complex uh, 
company, but you can't live without piping. We were sole source in nuclear subs, railroads, plumbing, heating, air conditioning, refrigeration. Everywhere we turned, we had a customer, and we only sold wholesale. We did not sell anything retail direct. So I set up distributors and tore them down and so forth. That was my job. This, this letter that you received when you retired is quite flattering. It says that you were the best salesman Stanley G. Flagg and company had ever had and that you really can't be replaced. They're just going to put somebody in your place and hope they do as well. But that's quite an accomplishment. Well, they started in 1850. So they were there a long time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered that you think would be important for people in, in uh, the future watching this to learn? Well, I'd like to say that I don't deny that I had a rough time in the service. I still believe in everything America does conservatively, and I think, uh, I hope people appreciate what the old time veterans did particularly the ones that died over there. I see so many young people, as I say, I went over to 88 and 11 of us come back alive. They gave their life, and you wonder if people really, really appreciate it. I think most of the people do. Uh, I'm against wars, but I think there's times and places it must be done. And we fought hard in World War II, and we gave a lot of concessions away. We treat our enemies with a lot of help. I'm not sure it's not coming back uh, in our face. But I'm, again, I'm still patriotic, and I agree uh, that the war we've got on, I'm somewhat against that, but I think we're fighting terrorism. Uh, a terrible cause. Islam uh, owned the world at one time. They want it again. They're willing to die for it. And I think we're in World War III very heavily. People don't believe that. They just don't know what's going on around us. The outcome, uh, I don't know. I hope my grandkids will be very strong. I teach them what I can, and I hope that they don't have to go through what I went through. But I survived, and I'm glad to, to be here alive today. And I want to thank you for your time. We want to thank you, too, because without you, I don't think any of us would be here you and those who contributed so much during the war. I furnished a lot of pictures of airplanes and bombing maps. He returned it all. I remember it weighed 15 pounds when I sent him. He's the son of a, a RAF man, uh, and he wrote several books. This one was about the fifth, primarily the 380th bombardment group. Now, he gave me credit in the book, uh, as he did others. Uh, I have taught at uh, UC a couple of speeches and so forth. I'm not very good at it, but uh, uh, when they are called on, I've given, uh, I don't know how many times, but I have a, a pretty good story to tell. And this book uh, described pretty much what we went through. And it says the illustrated story of Kenny's 5th Air Force. That was General Kennedy. And uh, oh, you do what you had to do at the time, and uh, I'm trying to survive to be a hundred years old and get a letter from the president.